Thanks, and thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks particularly to Harriet for giving us um, precious time today. Um, uh, we'll start in a minute. There will be a question and answer session afterwards, so please put your questions into the chat directed to Tim McNally and not to everyone, please. I'd be grateful if you could keep the uh, questions short. Um, Harriet has to go at seven o'clock. She's been very, very media busy today and is going back to to continuing her media involvement on the Sarah Everard um, issue. Um, I'll just say a few words and then uh, over to Harriet. Um, uh, Harriet of course has been a fighter for women and equality um, throughout her career before and during um, Parliament. She was the architect of the Equality Act 2010 uh, taking that through Parliament and ensuring it received the royal assent um, before the 2010 election um, was was called. Um, so I won't take up any more time. Harriet, uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Val, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm so sorry I can't be actually in the club tonight uh, with you all, but perhaps on some future occasion, because I've been to some very interesting meetings with you before, so I'm, I'm delighted to join you, albeit uh, remotely. And what I was going to do tonight is kind of raise with you issues about how far women have come over the years or how far we haven't come, uh, how much there are common concerns amongst women or how come or, or, or to what extent we all have very divergent and different concerns, um, how empowered we are to actually make change at the moment, what is our expectation of change, what's the role of men, what's the role of parliament, the issue of law and policy and actually Thinking about the absolutely tragic uh, case of Sarah Everard and all the discussion that has arisen around that, I thought that actually talking about that case shines a light on all of the other issues um, I wanted to raise with you. So perhaps we can sort of look at where women have or haven't got through that prism and of course it's incredibly sad that today we've heard the news we all dreaded, that actually those remains, as they called them, that were found in Kent were her body and just the heartbreak of thinking that her life has been short, cut short. And it always reminds me that when people say, oh, we have so much sympathy for the family at this difficult time, it's not about at this difficult time, it's for the rest of their lives that they are going to suffer this loss. And it's just the horror of the way that she lost her life is just unimaginable for them. And when Cressida Dick attempted to deal with the upsurge of anger and concern amongst women, which social media has reflected, and there's another issue about social media in all of this, um, she said, oh, it's very rare for a woman to be abducted and murdered from the street and sought to give reassurance that, of course, that didn't reassure women at all, because although women are not stupid and they know what the numbers are and they know that this is in the news because it is rare, they know their everyday experience of being threatened, of being followed, of a man who films them, of a man who tries to get their number, of a man who tries to get them in the car, a man who won't take no for an answer, a man who's following them when it's dark and when they're on their own, knowing that this is putting them in fear, but still not stopping. And of course, when that happens to you, you don't know how far it's gonna go. You don't know whether he's suddenly going to get a call and walk off or whether or not he is going to end up abducting you because you are outside the boundaries and that puts you in fear. And this is why women develop and girls develop strategies for the way they lead their lives. I heard on the radio one young woman saying, the end of an evening with my friends for me is not, you know, lots of hugs and good, good goodbye, goodbye, see you soon. It's all uh, stay safe on the way home, be sure to get an Uber, text when you get home. That is the overhang and that's women's realities. Um, young women 
um, even girls on their way home from school um, can be followed in the dark and harassed um, and have men following them in their cars. That's why women and girls have their keys in their hand. That's why they text, I'm on my way home, so that they know that somebody's looking out for them. That's why they ask their friends to follow them on their phone app so that they know they're being tracked. And although the technology has changed, what I'm absolutely, what I'm describing to many of you will have been the experience you've had as schoolgirls, um, you've had as young women, and it's exactly the same. It's always been the case. But what is so striking is that although this is something which affects women's daily lives and girls' daily lives, the extent to which hitherto it's not been talked about. So if a girl is followed home from school, she might well not tell her mother. She might well, most unlikely to tell the teacher the next day. She's most unlikely to discover that the topic of the assembly is what to do if a man follows you home from school. It's almost a, a universal experience which is universally not discussed. And I think the Sarah Everard case has torn away that, that veil of individualized dealing with it and has enabled women to come out and say, Yes, I'm putting up with that too. And once you hear it from everybody, you think, why on earth should we put it, be putting up with this? To be in fear is not a small thing. To be subject to an unofficial curfew where you can't go running at night after work, your husband or your partner can, but you can't because you'd feel fearful. Why should women be under that curfew? And I think that what's happened now is that there is a discussion and that is very, very important. In terms of the response of men, it's quite interesting that there's been some reaction on Twitter criticizing and saying this is demonizing all men and it's making men feel terrible and we should be supporting men in this situation. And I think that everybody should be very clear that this is not all men but it is enough men that it's all women. And you don't need that many men for it to be all women because that is evidently the case. So I don't want us to see men making themselves the center of this, except making themselves supportive of women, listening to women and supporting women, but certainly not making themselves the victim because very often, when women have sought change and uh, women have sort of sought advance, men have jumped forward into the way and said, this will be bad for us, you can't do it. So for example, when there was a protest against prevalence of domestic violence many decades ago, a lot of men said, this will undermine my role as head of the household because it will undermine my authority. Um, I have to be able to hit my wife from time to time if she's out of order, you are undermining me and it's my responsibility to be a head of household. When women argued for women equal pay, a lot of men argued this would undermine them at work because it would undermine their role as the breadwinner and it would undermine their role at home as the breadwinner. So we are once again seeing men come into the debate to make themselves the issue and I think women as they've always done, will understand this and not allow it to happen. But we can see that response uh, from some people. Um, so basically, what I feel we've not got now is we've got a, an, an argument which shows also the universality of women's experience. Quite often, there used to be an argument in the women's movement, oh, how can you say all women are the same? You know, women are black women, women are white women, women are older women, women are younger women, women are lesbian women or straight women, women are northern women, women are southern women, they're middle class or they're working class. But how interesting it is that there is so much of a universality amongst women, which I've always believed. And of course, when it comes to this, there is a universality for women. You are not immune to this because you're a working class woman in, woman in the North any more than you're immune to it as a middle class woman in the South. 
it doesn't matter whether you're lesbian or straight, you are still subject to this. And of course, age, whether you're a school child or uh, a woman in her 40s, you can still be um, subjected to this. So it reminds us of the common cause that we need to have as feminists, because there are many things that link us all together and where we're all in the same boat. Now, I think the other thing is that people will remember in the 1970s, there was the Reclaim the Light Night demonstrations and women made their voices heard and they spoke up and they demanded change and then nothing happened. And many of us were around at the time and many of us were supporting those movements at the time and indeed nothing did happen. And some people are saying, well, is it gonna be the same now? We're all gonna speak up and we're all gonna be outraged and then nothing's gonna change. But I think things are different now. And they are different because over the course of those decades, there are now women in institutions at all levels and there are women where the decisions are made. There are women in government in every department. There are women in parliament in all parties. There are women in all the agencies. So whereas women had a voice in the 70s, but were hundreds of miles away from power, now women are proximate to power. And with the power and force of women's voices in the country, they can use that to actually take those demands into where decisions are made. And that gets me to what should actually change. And as luck would have it, we've got a bill coming to the House of Commons on Monday, which is the police bill. And there are women and indeed supportive men on all sides of the House of Commons who will feel that something needs to be done about this. And we had a very good debate on international, in the, in the, in the, on the cause of International Women's Day on Thursday. And we had women from all sides of the house. We had Lib Dem women, SNP women, uh, Tory women, Labour women, and indeed uh, Tory men making very good speeches, which I can tell you from somebody who listened to the speeches that were made when I was first in the House of Commons, in 1982, I can tell you, I still have to nearly stop myself falling into a dead faint when I hear conservative men speaking progressively about women's causes, but it has happened. And that is the base for the Alliance for Change. So what we need to do is we need to be clear about our demands. You don't get anything changed and you get nothing done if you do not set out your demands. You have to say what you want and often, as women, we protest about the problem, but because we're used to not having power, we don't say what we want and what we demand. So I think the demands are always absolutely essential. So we need demands now. And the first demand that I think that we should make is everybody will know that curb crawling is a criminal offence if the man is seeking to find a woman to pay for sex. So curb crawling, uh, looking for prostitution is an offence, a criminal offence. Everybody's used to that. It's been the case for decades. But actually, if a man curb crawls following a schoolgirl going home from school in the dark on her own in her school uniform and tries to get her into his car, that is not an offence. Well, it should be. And how easy will it be to extend curb crawling, the offence that's there that we all know about, and extend it to all women, not just when the man is trying to buy sex, but anything where it is unwarranted, uninvited attention. And you know what? Men can actually drive in their cars from A to B, and they can get in and out of they, their cars, and that is absolutely fine in their vans, but they can't use their vehicles to threaten and intimidation, to intimidate women. So actually, it's not a problem for men to not be able to harass women when they're driving, to wind down their window and call at them and ask for their number and ask them to get in their car. They will manage without being able to do that. They will cope when this is a criminal offence, but it will change their behaviour. And I think if, if they know their number plates can be taken and they can be reported to the police, I mean, no man's going to want to be in the local paper reported um, for, having, uh, for having done this. So I think it will change pretty quickly. And I think that there's a number of things that we can do, some more slowly, some more quickly, where we say, these are the boundaries. This is what doesn't happen anymore. And Peter Bottomley, one of the Conservative MPs who spoke on Thursday said, we sometimes think 
can't, cultures can't change and things that we've done for ages will just keep on happening. But he said he remembered when seatbelts were introduced and men in particular said, that's not the way I drive. I don't need a seatbelt. You know, it will interfere with my driving. And actually it became the law and everybody drove with seatbelts on and nobody thought anything of it thereafter. And I think it's going to be like that in relation to street harassment. So I look forward to the day when you don't have to plan for leaving and getting home as a woman in a way that you don't have to plan as a man, where you can take the shortest route, route home. You don't have to always go the longest route if that's the busiest route. A young woman was telling me that she always takes two buses home at night because although it's much quicker to take one bus, the one bus stop is a little bit further away from her home. So she takes one bus changes onto another bus that gets her nearer to her home. All this planning, all these survival strategies, we don't want to be doing those anymore. And actually men are not entitled to make us have to do this. And we want to be able to walk the dog at night without worrying. We want to go running at night without worrying. And if it's not the majority of men that are doing it, which it certainly isn't, then why should the majority of men worry that the minority of men who've made so many women's lives a misery over so many decades, finally stop doing it. So I'm happy to answer any questions about this or about anything else you want to ask me. And finally, just to say the reason why I was late in on the call was because um, I've been talking to the organisers of the vigil on Clapham Common. And I, I think the police have really woefully mishandled this. They should have just sat down with them and said, right, what is it we can help you to do on Clapham Common, which is within the rules, and let's work it out. And instead, they just got into sort of banning mode, which is really stupid. And I hope that whatever the court said, and it sounds like the court has inevitably not said, yes, you can, or no, you can't. Um, but the court has said the police should go back and talk to the organisers and find a way of doing it within the law, which actually would have saved a lot of legal costs if they'd have listened to what I said, which is what I was saying they should do anyway. Uh, and hopefully they'll do that and we'll have some sort of vigils slash memorial slash protest on Clapham Common within the law, COVID safely tomorrow. Um, and then on Monday, I hope we'll be into the House of Commons and we'll start making changes. And in the meantime, we just think of the unimaginable lifelong grief of poor Sarah Everard's Family. Thank you, Harriet. That was uh, excellent. We, we've got a few questions. I'd like to go to Janet Berridge, who was the first woman chairman of the National Living Club and indeed started um, uh, our celebrations of International Women's Day, which is now International Women's Week. So, uh, Janet, over to you. Thank you very much, Val. And thank you, Harriet. That was very, very concise and very interesting. And it's, it is uh, reassuring to know that um, you've been in politics so long and you have seen change, positive change. Um, what I wanted to say was, um, do you think that it's not just a, a case of uh, changing laws, it's also, it would be also be very helpful if um, the education system could be uh, tied into this. Um, I remember many, many years ago uh, at school when we had sex education, you did biology and then a, a very forward thinking, um, I think it was the head teacher said, I'm bringing in a... Um, a marriage guidance counsellor to talk about things that, you know, will interest you girls. I was at a girls grammar school and uh, that was, it was really revealing that she had a different take on things. It wasn't just the biological aspects. It was, it was everything, you know, what happens if you get pregnant, what happens if, not just to, to a girl, but what, what are the consequences for the boy and that sort of thing. And I do think that schools have a, a role to play in this, um, making sure that girls aren't bullied by boys at school and, and that behaviour um, is uh, can change at that early age. Would you agree? Well, I absolutely agree. And I think the key thing is to, is to have right from the outset as part of you know, personal health and social education, um, the notion of consent, because I've never bought the argument that men who were groping women 
didn't realize that their advances were unwelcome. Either they didn't even bother to ask themselves whether there was consent or they knew there wasn't consent but thought they could get away with it. So I think, I think it's not about teaching boys and men to, to read the complicated signals of consent. They can work them out. They just need to abide by them. But I think that you're, you're right that the education system has to look ahead at things. And my goodness me, what challenges it's got with all these issues of kids having sex online, showing uh, videos and photographs um, uh, of themselves uh, nude and sharing them. Um, and the whole thing about relationships in a digital age and the question of gender and relationships in a digital age is definitely one where the education system needs to step forward and do their best to help. So your equivalent of your teacher bringing the Marriage Guidance Council is the teacher who's the whiz digital person in the school who can see where things are going and can talk to the kids in a way that shows he or she understands the digital stuff, which um, a lot of older people don't. But anyway, I certainly agree that it is, um, it is basically one for the education system as well, definitely. And you're probably about the same age as me. You'll remember all of this, won't you? You'll remember all of these things. Um, yeah. Yeah, harassment at work and all sorts of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and if you complain, people just sort of said, oh, don't be silly. Don't you understand a bit of fun? Yes, or, or that you ought to be flattered. I mean, that was the other oh, thing. Yes. You're, you know, if your uh, bum was groped, you should be flattered that it was your bum that was chosen to be groped. And I think there's something particularly awful about that, the idea that we should be grateful for this harassment. Uh, terrible. Yeah, things have moved on a bit. Uh, next up, uh, Dan Coat, who's a uh, fairly new member of the club. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Val. Um, hello, Harriet. Lovely to meet you. Hi. Nice um, I'm afraid it's a slightly lengthy question, so do bear with me briefly. That's um, short questions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we today obviously look at equality of women, and ultimately it comes down to the equality of all. Everyone being treated fairly based on their merit, not the colour of their skin, not the it, based on their character, based on the contribution they make to society. On Thursday, three government advisers quit over criticisms of the ignorant ministers, specifically making reference to Liz Trust, the Minister for Equalities. Transgender women are 10 times more likely to be impacted by conversion therapy, where victims currently, as of now, have no legal remedy or support. This obviously strikes at the heart of people's identity and ultimately puts lives at risk. What is your position on this and how do we hold the government accountable to the promises made in 2018 by Theresa May and reaffirmed by Boris Johnson in 2020 to ban conversion therapy? Right, well, conversion therapy, I don't know whether everybody is familiar with what it is, is it's basically, and it's therapy very much in adverted commas, mm. to actually uh, prove to you that you are not gay and therefore if you're thinking you're lesbian or gay this therapy will reinforce in you that you are um, heterosexual um, and obviously is the most extreme oppression and denial of identity and has been proved to cause multiple problems and is a complete well it's a denial of, of people's identity so it's a thoroughly horrible uh, and terrible thing. And the question is, what should public policy do about it? And one of the things that I'm quite interested, and it shouldn't happen, but, but then the question is, how do you deal with it? And one of the things that um, I've been interested in is whether or not we could, for example, get the Charities Commission to deregister as a charity any organization which purports to be a charity which is operating um, uh, conversion therapy or having anything to do with it. Um, whether or not every um, professional, you know, college of therapists or, um, uh, um, you know, professional body should, everybody should be, know that they would be struck off if they engage in it in any way, shape or form. So you can't have any professional accreditation. So that um, 
councils, um, if anybody is operating in council premises, um, uh, that they can't uh, do this. And I think in a way, actually, sucking the finance and space and oxygen out of this might be a way of doing it. Um, um, but I think there's consideration about how it should be done, whether or not you make it a criminal offence or whether or not you just squeeze out the ability for it to operate anywhere. Um, so I've been, I, I don't know what the government are going to come up with on this. Um, they seem to be... Um, reneging on it, but I, I don't see that they will hold that position for long. I mean, the one thing about this government is that they're quite happy to do U-turns and then they're quite happy to do some more U-turns again. So, uh, you, you know, the fact that they're in the wrong position now doesn't mean that they won't be in the right position in the future. So I think we should keep up our confidence and determination to get rid of conversion therapy. It's, you know, we'll look back on it in sort of 20 years if we don't even look back on it now and think it's absolutely horrific. Um, uh, you know, it's like branding people witches and then ducking them in a witch's pool type of thing. It's just absolutely horrific. Uh, how do you think it should be dealt with? Thank you. Um, thank you for asking the question. It's very kind. Um, in all honesty, I think there's no one size fits all, I think is obviously the, there is, it's probably some religious leaders will have different views than others on it. However, it is most certainly, in my opinion, deplorable. It in my opinion, should be a criminal offence, especially where it is in the nature where they are forced into the action where many of colour are, and that is obviously where um, many asexual individuals are impacted and those of colour are affected more egregiously than those necessarily of white from, from a recent survey, um, which was highlighted in Kent Pride's letter um, last week. I, I personally would agree with you. I think squeezing any viability out of the option banning premises you can't register as a charity you're not eligible for any grant you're not eligible for funding um ultimately cardinizing it cardinizing the topic making it taboo in the sense of that it's physically and quite difficult to operate will obviously change actually how it operates i think it as culture many people aren't actually aware that it's it's still a thing um, that it's had people just uh, may assume of course we don't do that nowadays but sadly it is and I personally do think the government are reneging on that and I do think we need to hold them to their promises and be very clear because over seven percent of the LGBT community have openly and obviously there's probably a lot more have said they've been grossly affected by it seven yeah. percent is obviously an inordinately high number it is it is terrible okay thank you Okay, um, next up, Mariana Cherry, another family member. You, you need to unmute, thank you. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Thank you very much for coming today. It's very topical at the moment, particularly with the vigil tomorrow. My question is, so there's a lot of um, movies where there's rape present, and it's in all glorifying sort of horrifying, glorifying glory, as it say. And I just wonder whether we could make some kind of, some kind of law and rules where rape in the movies of women or children, obviously we don't have uh, rape of children because it's very, very uh, criminal. So we don't have many times, we don't see much often rape of children on the television and in the movies. But quite often in the most prominent films, we could see rape of women. And I think that creates some kind of precedent to, and also maybe even a role model for some, maybe not, not, not so uh, normal, I would say, men, that this is the way to do it. So, um, so and then again, children, they take a lot of... Um, the, the movies inspire them also like a role model um, as we grow up my role models were gone with the wind or pride and prejudice and that's how I learn about how the girl's supposed to keep herself and you don't think about it today I'm going to think about it tomorrow as Kyla Tohara so we can't undermine how how serious the movie 
uh, industry is affecting young minds. And so um, how can you make that into a law? Who can propose <coughs> this thing to say, no, you cannot show in the same way as you can't show rape of children in the movies. You, in the same way, you cannot show rape of women in the movies because our society is just so unethical. We couldn't possibly allow this to happen, to show this kind of behavior in the movies. What do you think about it? Thank you. Well, I think that that is um, a very interesting point. And I think that it's something that is being thought of by the, you know, British Board of Film Censors and by Ofcom thinking in relation to television. And they have, they have to deal with these social changes. I mean, it's like, first off, the BBC struck a great change when they allowed the first gay kiss on EastEnders and that was regarded as completely unconscionable but they worked out that that's the way things um, you know they, they should be allowed to portray that and that that was with the mood of the culture of the times and going forward and so there are boards in the BBC, in Ofcom, in the British Board of Censors and such like um, who think about where the boundaries should be drawn. Um, and, but there is also an enormous role here for the social media companies, because for every film that is watched in a cinema or that comes down Sky Movies or something like that, there are countless others that are made on a micro budget or no budget at all, uh, with people just doing it off their... Uh, phones and putting it together completely informally and then streaming it on the internet. So I think that there is a really big role for social media companies. Now, they, after a little while, um, agreed that they will have protocol against child pornography. I mean, originally it was like, oh, we're just a platform, it's nothing to do with us, we're not the police, we're not here to police that. But then they accepted that they needed to take down that material and that if they didn't, they were colluding um, in child assault and child rape. Um, and so, so they have, because of their huge success and their huge power, they have taken onto what has fallen onto their shoulders are these very big decisions. And the question is, how much you let them do that of their own through their own processes and decision-making or how much you regulate them to actually tell them you can do this and you can't do that. And I think that will certainly have to be done on an international basis as well, because of course, these platforms don't operate just within one country. So I think just as we have to work together to tackle climate change, um, just as we have to work together to tackle human trafficking, we also have to work together to, dis to tackle um, that sort of thing. But I think it's quite a deep and uh, difficult question, but it's definitely one which we need to be addressing bit by bit. I have to say, I love your backdrop. Are you really on a desert island with a, a breeze blowing through the palm trees? Not at all, <laughs> not at all. I'm in my sitting room, you could see the sofa is deadly giveaway. Oh, I see. <laughs> But it's just a nice dream. Very of nice. Having that, to... That's Mariana's constant um, backdrop for our session. Very nice. Uh, next up is uh, His Honour Charles uh, Welshman, a uh, former judge, so um, lawyer to lawyer. Here you go. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Harm, for finding the time to talk to us on this vitally important subject uh, at, th at this time. Um, I'm coming through, am I? I'm not sure. I yes, yes, I can hear you. Good, good, good. Um, uh, obviously, I mean, this is a, a very, very, very important issue. Um, the, the thing that concerns me greatly on what you said is I think there's a lot to be said for a new uh, curb crawling offence. Uh, and uh, I think that... But as you Oh, um, Charles, we're losing you, Charles. He's in a desperate state at the present time. And the question of having the resources available to deal with this 
well, I'm, I'm sorry, whether, whether the resources are available to uh, deal with uh, deal with an, a, a new offence, which ought to be dealt with uh, really very promptly if, if and when it, it occurs. Um, well, so I, I just lost a, a little bit of you saying, if you introduce a new offence, um, will there be enough resources to deal with it? Um, yeah. And you have to take that into account. Um, that's always an issue. I mean, I remember when we were in government every time um, uh, we proposed a new offence in relation to sexual assault or something like that. It was my goodness me, but we're supposed to be reducing the prison population. This will fill them up. And you obviously have to think of the down the line, uh, downstream uh, consequences. But I think that that actually, if you're if you're looking, if you're if you're dealing with behaviour change in a public place, it is a bit like seatbelts. In that, once people accept that this is what you've got to do, I don't think that they have a massive problem of enforcing people wearing seatbelts. They did to begin with, but actually then people just got used to it and they all did it. So I think it's a bit like that. It's just about people recognizing that there has to be behavioral change. We're not dealing with acquisitive crime here where there's a kind of battle where people will just keep on and on and on because they want to get the money from acquisitive crime. Um, and therefore I think that uh, it shouldn't take impossible numbers of resources and um uh hello can you still hear me i can you hear feel? you oh good well, I've, got you I've got another call coming in which is why you can't see me right. um, okay i'm going to try and get rid of this call okay um so i think that it should be uh, perfectly possible i did toy with the idea of making it something that would be subject to a fixed penalty notice we're now absolutely gung-ho for fixed penalty notices COVID fixed penalty notices can go up to £10,000 and you can't even challenge them. I thought that would be marvellous. £10,000 for a man who curb crawls a young girl on the way home from school at the cost of £10,000 without being able to challenge it. I think that would sort people out quick as a flash, but probably you'd need a bit more, um, uh, a bit more administration of justice than that. The, the most, maybe the most effective weapon would actually be to either disqualify from driving uh, pro tem before the matter's dealt with. If it oh my goodness me, that is a brilliant idea. There is, that is or absolutely, that is such a good idea. Do curb crawling and you lose your license. Oh my word, that is such a good idea. Thank you, Charles. That is now my policy. There's one thing men don't want to do, it's lose their driving license. Yes, absolutely. Excellent, excellent. Uh, um, next is uh, uh, a long-standing and uh, very active member of the club, Angela Sire. First of all, well done, Charles. Excellent. Yes. Um, I, until 2002, I was an elected member of, of the London Borough of Richmond, and uh, uh, part of my role of that I got co-opted on to Relate, and during my tenure of office in Relate, we actually um, uh, inaugurated a policy with the sanction of the Education Committee as well uh, for Relate trained of people to go into schools to talk about these subjects. Now, um, it's long since since I handed over my baton, um, but I, I ho do hope that there is still government money being paid towards this organisation, which is, is national um, for such a policy. Well, I think the reminder of the role that organisations like Relate and Marriage Guidance Council have paid for, played for many years is, is, quite, um, is quite a useful reminder that there are these organizations which are not state organizations, um, but which are kind of, you know, third sector organizations and could play a role here. I think that's a very, very interesting point. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Relate saves the government a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, final question, because I am conscious that you do need to go spot on uh, seven, don't want to cut you off at all. So 
Uh, we'll go to Ishal Zhu, who's a, a member of the Club and on the General Committee. Um, thank you, Harriet. Such a good talk. I was just wondering, just, um, not, not a, really a question, just uh, I was reading this book you wrote oh. five six years ago. I think even you wrote five six years ago, apart from lots of information, how you get into politics, but also it's very in time now, it's we talk about uh, women's rights, equity, so it's very, very good. I think this book is good. Um, just want to know, do you are going to write another one? Because this is like five years ago. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your comments, and I'm glad you've um, enjoyed it. Um, I was thinking about writing another book because there's, there's two things. Firstly, that as feminism has grown more confident, I think it's become less wary about the potential of a backlash. And I think the misogyny is a bit like a cockroach. You think you've killed it and blimey, it crawls back out again and then multiplies. And I think that it would be a mistake to think that because we've won so many battles recently, that we are free from the, the threat of, of misogyny. And also that because we've won a lot of battles, and because there are so many more people who would count themselves as feminists, there's been a kind of sectionalization of feminists. So you have corporate feminists, you have um, trade union feminists, you have um, uh, um, black feminists, you have um, uh, women whose concerns are, are gay rights and trans rights, and that you've got feminists who, who would argue actually it's all about um, women in the North because they have much more of a difficult time than women in the South and therefore that's where it should all focus. And I think that what we've got to do, as I said at the outset, is focus on what we have in common and all work together. Because, you know, there's an old saying, unity is strength. And if we focus on our common concerns and our common demands, then actually we can make really good pro progress. So we mustn't factionalize too much and we mustn't be unguarded in the face of always the potential for a misogynist backlash. And I thought I might write a book about that, but um, it might be a bit the same as the one I've always written. I've already written, unfortunately. Do you think that sounds like I've already written that in my book? <laughs> you mean, yeah, yeah, it's very young. It's like I, I could, I'm surprised it's written five years ago. And also, your mom used to come to our club, Black Liberal Club, uh, with, uh, for Catholic Society lunch. You must come. She did. Yeah, she yeah. did. Yeah, she did. Come. She was uh, very active. But you must come you, when, when the lockdown uh, finishes. Well, she just died two years ago at the age of 100. Wow. So that must mean I'm going to live to about 110. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you will. I'm just going to slip in one very last question from um, Nicola Williams. Nicola, over to you. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. Hi, Nicola. Great. Hello, Harriet. I hope you don't mind me calling you Harriet. No, no, please do. Okay. Um, I, it's, it's, first of all, I'd love to see you write another book. That's the first thing. Um, secondly, I, I totally agree with you that we, we, we all have to as, as women, you don't want to, particularly as, as women that consider, we, if we consider ourselves feminists, that we don't end up in different silos, like the examples that you've just given. However, the question I'm going to ask you is probably in a, in a way slightly related to that, but I'd be interested in your comment on, on it. I know that you're on the Human Rights Committee, you certainly were at the end of last year. And I remember when the um, report about Black people, racism and human rights came out and the recommendations that you were making and the, uh, uh, well, about a lot of indignities that black people had suffered. So when I'm thinking about that report, and I'm thinking in the context of particularly the, what's happened to, to, to that poor young woman on, on Clapham Common, all women are subject to street harassment, domestic violence and, and, and rape, or, or some sort of like sexual intimidation. That's certainly happened to me. And, I, and, and I'm pretty sure most, if not all of the women on the on present, they would have had something like that that's happened to them. However, um, when that happens to black women, um, I'm sure other women of color, but particularly for black women, um, there's a differential, a difference of approach when that has happened to black women, because there was a, a, a sense that 
um, women that that have had awful things happen to them have a virtue to protect, but black women don't have a virtue to protect. So in other words, a black woman, if she complains about being street harassed or being uh, assaulted in her home for domestic violence or being raped, there's a slight, there is a difference of approach, a difference of treatment to women of color who make those complaints. Um, I'm glad that you're nodding because you agree, which is mm -hmm. great. I was gonna ask mm -hmm. you what your, what your opinion was on that because what it will do, it will make black women less likely to complain or come forward about that if they feel they're going to be treated as somebody who quote unquote asked for it uh, and, and are more likely to, to, to think that. And particularly as we know that the, the murder in, 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 in Sarah Everard's case is a police officer and the historic um, views that black people have about police, it's all complicating that whole dynamic about women complaining about um, matters of sexual violence or, or sexual harassment happening to them. So I'd be interested in your views on that. Well, I think that what you raise is a very important point. And I would, I certainly wouldn't argue when I say we shouldn't be factionalized about it, that we shouldn't be incredibly intelligent and understanding of the differences and the different cultural factors and how they can play into these issues. I remember when I was um, uh, a law officer, solicitor general in the government, um, and we were, um, arguing for progress on domestic violence, um, talking to um, a, a, a group of black men who were working with other men on the issue of domestic violence and, and trying to beat back the argument, well, in our culture, you're not a proper man if you don't keep your wife in order by violence um, that is our culture. Our culture is to be able to be disciplining our wives by force. You mustn't interfere with our culture. And the, there was a, a black men's group whereby black men themselves would be challenging that and saying that does not define our masculinity. No, it, and doesn't. it doesn't define culture either. So. Exactly. And that, that you can't use cultural excuses and that a black woman has every bit as much of an entitlement to be safe in a, her own home as, as a white woman. And, um, and also that a recognition, and we had this in a, in a number of cases that I was involved in when I was Solicitor General, there was a, um, a, a, a woman in an Asian family who was... Um, horribly raped by um, her brother-in-law every time her husband was out. And because she was in a hierarchy within his home, she was completely powerless and had to, was subjected to this for years. She was more or less like a prisoner in her home. And he, he just used her as a sex slave and within the family hierarchy, she had no right to speak out. And when it came to court, the judge said, I'm going to give him an extra high sentence because he took advantage of her vulnerability within that circumstance. So I think that you've always got to take your, you've got to have universal principles. Every woman is entitled not to be assaulted, harassed, raped, and they've all got an equal entitlement, but they've got different vulnerabilities and men, there should be a universal denial of men's excuses, um, including cultural excuses. And a lot of people would feel, oh, that's terrible because we want to be anti-racist, so we can't be impinging on their culture. Um, no, and can, can I say as a black, I, I'm, I'm not speaking for all black communities, I can speak for my own, but I can absolutely tell you in all the black communities I know about, there's nothing cultural about assaulting a woman. Exactly. That's something that's said by a man who wants to abuse power. But the only yeah. rider I would like to say on top of that is if a woman, if a black woman does come forward, goes to a police station, I'm a lawyer as well. So she comes forward, she goes to a police station, she makes, a, she makes a complaint. She will be treated, rape victims are generally not treated very well or people women that complain about rape. If you're black and you complain about rape because of the stereotypes about black women being overly sexual, there is a difference in how you treated if you complain about that and if you complain about street harassment there was a perception that well you know you're big and strong strong black woman you could take care of yourself if you're street harassed so it's getting rid of those perceptions from the people who are supposed to help those women but i think in a way the only way you really slay those perceptions 
is if you have an integrated workforce. If you've got a white male workforce, then it's much harder to deal with all the prejudices and the canteen culture. And therefore we need to see the police force reflect black women and men as well as white women and men. And then there will be able to be a development of more trusting relationship. And there ought to be because they're your police service as much as they're anybody else's, but that's not the way it feels. And I think that's the same we've also found on the Joint Committee on Human Rights, that there is an overwhelming feeling. We did some polling in the black community exclusively and an overwhelming feeling, not only that the police would treat you differently, but also that the health service would treat you differently. And that was a very stark uh, reminder that um, we've got a very long way to go in terms of, of tackling inequality. Thanks for that. We're getting what sort, of, what sort of lawyer are you, Nicola? Oh, sorry. What, um, Nicola, what, I what? am a, sorry, I've been unmuted again. Uh, well, I, I was at the bar. I, I now sit as a Crown Court recorder. And oh, I brilliant. was the, um, yeah, I, I was the service complaints ombudsman for the UK Armed Forces up until the end of last year. Oh, wow. Gosh, that must yeah. have been uh, interesting. Please let me introduce yeah, that's a whole other discussion. Both of you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, if, if, if Harriet comes to the club, um, you can have that conversation elsewhere. Um, I, I'd like, because it's very close to seven o'clock, I'd like to cut to Kate to give a vote of thanks for it. Wow. I'm actually almost speechless, which is probably good, which means the vote of thanks can be short, short, short. I was going to go on about your illustrious parliamentary and ministerial career. No time for that. It's on Wikipedia. But what I did notice when I was looking into this, you have always been at the forefront of women's rights and the rights of anyone who's been marginalized in society. Um, your time in Parliament, which has been a most incredible time, um, you've maintained a steady and steadying presence and a focus on justice and fairness rather than attaining high office. Huge respect for that. I think the number of women in the Commons has expanded because of women MPs like you. The whole evening, everyone in my timeline is talking about, a timeline is talking about this case, social media timeline. We're all feeling this. It doesn't matter if you're 16 or you're 60. The keys, the looking at the clock, the making sure you have, you know, you look at the, I mean, women so much more than men look at the, Uber drivers, the license plate and things like that. We are, this has just been incredible. Thank you so, so much. We are so privileged that you have taken the time to speak to us this evening. And like you, all of us here and at the National Liberal Club in general are not gonna stop shouting until to quote you, this is what doesn't happen anymore. So really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna round out the rest of the, NLC, the, the NLC's week of um, International Women's Day events. Harriet, I understand you have to go, so. Well, thank you very much indeed. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I'm sorry I'm not there amongst all the wood paneling, paneling, sampling the wine with you, but I will in some future occasion. And thank you for that very kind and, and lovely um, vote of thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the rest we'll of your evening. Together soon, thank you. Bye. Right. Thank you. So for the rest of us, this talks talk marks the final National Liberal Club's 2021 event for International Women's Day. You can tell I'm back on script. It's been more of an International Women's Week. I would like first of all to thank Val Stansfield for curating such an excellent program and Tim McNally and company for looking after the technical side of things. Thank you too to all members and guests who are here this evening. We hope you will be back next year when we plan to take over the whole week once more and make this event bigger and better with talks and exhibitions in the club itself while still reaching out to our Zoom audience. 2021 is going to be a hard act to follow, particularly given this evening's talk, but I think we can do it. Thank you again.